we study God's word at music camp and God commands us to sing as uh, to let his word dwell in us richly in psalms, hymns and spiritual songs. We're to worship him musically, we're to proclaim his word musically. And so we want to train up our, our students, our children, to be able to sing skillfully with music, to understand what they're doing. The Bible says sing with understanding. But it's all couched in studying God's word, growing up as Christian worshipers. The default in our culture today is to be a music consumer. We are conditioned by the age we live in and the technology we have to be people who listen to music and it's an important part of our life. But we have lost something that our forefathers knew, which was being active participants in music. It used to be if you wanted music, you had to make the music. And now we, we just press a button. But uh, these students uh, are learning through the course of their time at music camp, not to be music consumers, but to be active participants in making music. So not only to learn how to sing well, how to understand music as it's written on a page and how it comes together in a group environment, but to be able to take those experiences and have them be the seeds that are planted for their involvement their whole life in the musical life of the church. We want these students to be the next wave of worshipers in the church who know how to sing to God. On the Fight Laugh Feast Network, good to be with you. It's Friday. It's Friday. I feel. I feel. I feel like it needed to be Friday. Uh, Pastor Toby is still not in the studio, but we got we replaced him with Pastor Wiley. I mean, is that an upgrade or? Where? Well, yeah, I, I think so. All right, it's live. Uh, Chuck Knox and I'm the Water Boy. But he's already on the show on the network, so know, it's not. Know, we can't man. trade. And I don't yeah. know if the Theology Podcast yeah. is willing to give up. Chris, thanks for so, joining us, man. Yeah, glad to be here. This yeah. is a lot of fun. Yeah, it's been it's been a while too long. Yeah, yeah, too long. Yeah, um, it's Friday. You, and, you uh, didn't do a wrap up, did you? Well, I didn't do I didn't do a wrap up. I, I'm not I'm not as skilled. Pastor Toby's wrap ups are pretty good. Yeah, I don't I couldn't go there. So, so no weekly wrap up. Sorry, guys. Anyways, but we also we also have Professor Piercy on to talk about uh, the war. Her, her latest book. No one even knows it. it's coming out. Yeah. Not even it's not even you know out yet. The toxic it, war on masculinity. masculinity. Yeah, pretty excited to, to talk to her. I've been waiting for this. I've been wanting to talk to her for a long time. We have. Yeah, and I've reached out to her probably like twenty times, and finally. <laughs> yeah, we're pretty low finally. on the totem pole, but she gets around to us. <laughs> but first, fellas, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, it's 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 Women's Month. That's what March is, oh. and in honor of Women's Month, uh, you should join the Cross Politic Club membership. That was good. That was a good turn. I want to ask Nancy about that. We'll ask her if, we, if women need okay. a month. All right. All right. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, it's never been a better time in March to become a club member at Cross Politic. This year, Cross Politic will be dropping exclusive content in our club portal. We're actually upgrading our app for some of this that's coming. Some of this content will include Bible studies with Pastor Toby. He's got this great Bible series on Proverbs. Wisdom for Kings. Wisdom for Kings. A special with New St. Andrews President Dr. Ben Merkel our backstage content, which drops regularly, and our conference talks. And, of course, it, you'll actually get a discount at our conference this year at the ARC Encounter. Yeah. Um, and, and if you know if you don't sign up for the club and you go to the conference, you're losing money. So you might as well join join the club. So you can <laughs> go to fightlaughfeast.com to join the club. Man, we are so glad to have uh, Professor Nancy Piercy on the show with us today. She's the best-selling author of Total Truth, The Soul of Science, Saving Leonardo, Finding Truth, uh, Saving Leonardo was one of my friend's favorite books from, yeah, yeah. from Nancy. You know, he's a public school teacher and actually l loved it and it really helped him out Leonardo? a lot. Leonardo? Um, yeah, Leonardo. Did I say what did mm, I say? No, no, that, just didn't. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> die. It's Friday. Love thy body. And, yes. the, and coming this June, the toxic war on masculinity, how Christianity reconciles the sexes. So, uh, Professor Piercy, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you so much for having me. It sounds like it's going to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> you know, okay, I know we're going to talk about toxic masculinity here, the war on masculinity, but I have to ask you, do women need a women's month? For March? <laughs> I know that's out of left field, but I'm just wondering what, what your thought is on that. I didn't even know much that March was Women's Month, me so I'm, I don't have a quick answer to that one because I it took me by surprise. I have no <laughs> idea that there was a Women's Month. 
Well, there you go. It, there look, go. look, so uh, breaking answer, news on cross politics. The answer is no. <laughs> I'll take that as a no. <laughs> well, it, it, more, more or less, the presupposition is that every other time of the year is white guy month or yeah. white guy day. Yeah. That's yeah. kind of the operative sort of the, yeah. the, sort of the operating philosophy. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so I guess we could take like control of every other. Day, month or day, day yes, right. except for Black History Month and Women's Women's yeah. Month, and then maybe <laughs> June or. I, I want to know yeah. before we get into her book. Um, uh, you discipled under Francis Schaeffer, who we love and read a lot of. Yeah. We've been influenced by his thinking yeah. uh, uh, significantly. My dad uh, was actually tutored by Rush Dooney, and so there's all sorts of um, kind of connections. Uh, when my dad became a Christian under the Jesus Jesus Revolution. Uh, uh, during the 1960s and 70s when my dad became a Christian, he kind of just immediately became reformed by the grace of God. He actually worked at a, a good bookstore that actually sold good books in California, which is, which is how you I remember that. Reformed. I remember that, uh, that chain. Sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, what was it like um, being discipled by uh, Francis Schaefer? And you, you, you were agnostic for the longest time. Yeah, I went there as a non-Christian. Mm -hmm. Um, and by the way, people sometimes ask me, why would you go to a Christian ministry if you were not a Christian? And the answer is actually that I had some uh, family members uh, who were just traveling through and stopped there for a weekend. And, oh, I was, I should say, I was uh, studying in Germany. We had lived in Germany when I was a kid, so I'd gone back. Mm -hmm. And so once I had family members stopping at La Brie, uh, Francis Schaeffer's ministry in Switzerland, um, they said, hey, come down and see us. So I went down to see my family. I did not go in order to go to a Christian ministry. I had no interest in Christianity right. at the time. Uh, in fact, I, I, the first time I went, I, I didn't even stay very long. I stayed a month. Um, and, uh, and a year and a half later, I went back and, and stayed then for uh, four months. Wow. So it was two, two times. <laughs> I was there twice because I was too stubborn the first time. <laughs> I, I did not become a Christian the first time. Okay. Um, so, yeah, but what was it like? Well, obviously, it was inc incredibly influential on my life because yeah. it was because of my first visit to Libri that I eventually became a Christian and then went back wow. in order to get, you know, so, uh, sort of grounded in my Christian understanding. So it, it had a huge influence on me because because I had been raised in a Christian home, Lutheran, okay. Lutheran. Mm -hmm. My dad's Swedish, my mom's Norwegian. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so. With Scandinavian, but as you may know, in ethnic homes, it's it's kind of like all Irish or Catholic. In ethnic homes, sometimes there's not a lot of really personal commitment because people are relying on the ethnicity to hold you. And so, when I started asking questions in high school, about halfway through high school, I just started wondering, you know, how why do we know Christianity is true? That was really my only question. How do we know it's true? And I, I spoke to my father, who was a university professor, and I said, point blank, just why are you a Christian? He said, works for me. Mm. I said, what? <laughs> That's it? And I had a chance to talk to a seminary dean, who uh, actually was my uncle. And all he said was, don't worry, we all have doubts sometimes. And I thought, well, why don't you have any answers then? But wow. my doubts. So that wow. was the quality of answers I got. And I realize I decided, well, maybe Christianity just doesn't have any answers. And so I very intentionally walked away from my Christian faith and started on a search for truth. I yeah. decided it was up to me to figure out what was true. And that's how I got into philosophy, by the way. Um, I started saying, well, who who even talks about these things? If I can't get any of the adults in my life, maybe it's these these dead white guys, you know, <laughs> after all, that's their job, you yeah. know, as a philosopher, their job is to say, what is truth? How do we know it? Is there meaning to life? Is there a foundation for ethics? Or is it just true for me, true for you? And I very quickly realized that if there was no God, the answer was no to all of those things. There is no meaning to life. There is no there, there is no truth. Uh, I, I thought, well, if all, all I have is my puny brain and the vast scope of time and history, then how could I think I would know some sort of absolute, objective, universal truth? Mm -hmm. Ridiculous. Yeah. And that's how I thought of it as a 16-year-old. So you know, clearly ridiculous. So you, uh, I had, by the time I went to Libri, I had <laughs> absorbed all these secular isms, you know, relativism, skepticism, determinism. Um, so I was, I was ripe. I was very ripe for the approach at Libri because it was an apologetics ministry. I don't think I would have become a Christian without apologetics. Mm. Wow. So you kind of went on that journey, and then obviously, <sighs> you know, you've written a number of books down down the road, and and you come to 
your latest book, Toxic War on Masculinity, as a woman, why did you feel like you needed to write this book? Um, there were a couple of reasons, and uh, Chris Wiley will understand one of them. <laughs> and that is I had written on the on the household historically, which he's, you know, which Chris has written on as well. Uh, in, in love, that, excuse me, in total truth, I had written on the role of the household historically, how men and women used to work together, you know, in on farms and in family industries. And how the Industrial Revolution you know, sort of tore apart the family. It, it split the working relationship between husband and wife. It took the father out of the home. It left boys without a day-to-day -day model. And in total truth, I focused a little more on the impact on women and how this was, how this explains the feminist movement. Uh, but when I got around to thinking, I'd like to, I'd like to pursue this more. You know, I wrote, a, I wrote the, was it the foreword or the introduction? Yeah, yeah to, to book, to yeah. To Chris's book on the on the household, and I thought I I would like to revisit, but but I would like to revisit this theme, but I don't want to do feminism. <laughs> That's old hat now. You know, the real issue before us today is men. And men are you know uh, male bashing has become a common pastime today, and I was much more interested in explaining how the industrial revolution has had impact on men and how it contributed to the you know the, the definition of men as toxic, so to speak. I'm, go, go, I'm sorry, Pastor. I always give our guests the first right of refusal for questions and answers. Go no, ahead. No, no. Your, your chapter in uh, Total Truth is great on the household and really uh, was helpful to me. I guess uh, one of the things, as I think about this particular subject, Nancy, is uh, like when I was a younger man, uh, there was often a, a set of uh, – there were settings in which men were with men and would behave in certain ways. And then it was understood that when a, a woman came into the room, mm. you would change your, your – you know, sort of your way of interacting with each other. Okay, there's a, there's a woman here. That's not an appropriate, uh, you know, item for discussion right now. And often there would be older men who would kind of police the younger guys on that kind of stuff. And uh, that's not necessarily the case today, or at least I don't, I don't see it maybe outside of church settings. Uh, have you thought about that at all and how maybe um, how some developments here in in our recent uh, sort of social milieu uh, have broken down these, uh, well, I guess the, the, the etiquette, the manner, the manners of young men and they no longer, uh, well, I, I guess what I'm getting at is maybe, maybe there are some things that men do today that are toxic that in the past uh, wouldn't have been uh, – uh, well, wouldn't have found their way into mixed company, if you know mm -hmm. what I mean. Yeah, yeah. I start my book well, um, with an interesting sociological study that was done um, as an ingenious experiment. Well, a sociologist went literally around the world. He went to countries all over the world, and he found out there were two competing scripts for men, for masculinity. He would say... Um, he would ask young men two questions. He would start by saying, what does it mean to be a good man? If you hear a eulogy and someone says he was a good man, what does that mean? And the men had no trouble answering. They said honor, duty, mm. integrity, sacrifice, do the right thing. Stand up for the little guy. I thought that was cute. Stand <laughs> up for the little guy. <laughs> be generous, be a protector, be a provider. And he would say, well, where'd you learn that? And they would often say, well, it's just it's the air we breathe, it, you know, and, and in the West, they would say it's it's a Judeo Christian heritage. Mm -hmm. And and then he would say, OK, fine. What do what, what if I said man up, be a real man? And they'd say, oh, no, no, that's completely different. That means be tough, never show weakness, uh, win at all costs, suck it up, play through pain. And, and I thought this was funny. Be competitive. Get rich, get laid. Okay, that's their that's their language. Sure. <laughs> get rich, get laid. <laughs> and I thought, oh my, this is fascinating because men themselves feel the uh, conf the conflict between these two scripts uh, for masculinity. On the one hand, they do hold the ideal of the good man, and I think that's what you're talking about, Chris. When people when, when men would police each other, especially in pro in the presence of women, but men feel the social pressure to be the real man as defined by secular standards. And what I found is that by starting with this, the, the two conflicting scripts for men, is it tended to disarm a lot of controversy. <laughs> you guys will appreciate this. 
this has proved to be the most controversial book I've ever written. <laughs> and <laughs> sure. That took me by surprise because Love Thy Body was about things like abortion, yep. homosexuality, transgenderism. Yeah. I really thought that would be the most controversial. But no, in Christian circles, this has proved to be more controversial. Oh, that's, so, that's, that's, that's interesting, Nancy. Yeah. Yeah, let me, let me yeah. uh, uh, stop you here at this point. In Christian circles, this is the controversial book. That's interesting. So yeah. are you getting any pushback maybe outside of Christian circles on the book? Uh, well, of course, they don't know about it yet since okay. it hasn't been published. Okay. Um, so it's what I did is I taught it in classes. I taught the manuscript in classes. I had uh, what I do with all my books is I have a lot of reading groups, <laughs> um, which is really helpful because they help me find all the rough edges. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, it was, uh, it's really it's very helpful. And, um, and and then, of course, I have individual readers, expert reviewers and so on. Um, so when I talk about the controversy, I mean, yeah, it's been in Christian circles. So on the one hand, my young female students are all feminists, and they would get triggered whenever I said anything positive about men. Like I could say, men are strong, and they'd say, well, women are strong too. Right, right. <laughs> right. And then, but men would also get triggered. Uh, I told my class I was writing a book on masculinity, and one male student shot back, what masculinity? It's been beaten out of us. Mm. And, and what's a woman writing a book on this? Any? Why is a woman writing a book on this anyway? So uh, the the response I tended to get was, "Whose side are you on? Whose side are you on? Are you going to bash men? You know, you're feminist. Who's out to bash men? Or are you sort of a super conservative who's going to defend men?" Um, and as you know, because you, I, I presume maybe you've got the manuscript. I try to be objective and biblical. Mm-hmm. So um, I'm. I'm trying to uh, support the good man script against the secular real man script yeah. um, and, and come up with, a, 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 as Christians, we are not, we're in the world, but not of it. We should be able to rise above the controversy and come up with a biblical position. That, that, that brings me to, uh, you know, I want to discuss with you, what was kind of your biblical defense of kind of a, a true masculinity? Oh, you know... Interestingly enough, uh, I mean, I have a lot of Bible passages, of course, but the, the thing that I found most most persuasive uh, was sheer biology. <laughs> um, mm. Biologically speaking, men have testosterone, which makes them stronger, larger, faster. Mm-hmm. It also tends to make them, uh, you know, on average, on oh, average, triggered. more. I'm triggered. <laughs> triggered. Oh, man. How could you? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> makes them more aggressive and more risk taking. And these things are good. We need to affirm them. This is how God made men. Um, I I did read, there's a book out that was the first cross-cultural um, analysis of concepts of masculinity. It's done by an anthropologist. So he went around the world uh, to several different cultures looking at what is their view of masculinity. And he found all cultures expect the good man to do three things, the three P's, he calls them, <laughs> provide, protect, and procreate, meaning become fathers. Mm-hmm. So this is universal. Mm-hmm. Because men are made in God's image, even men who are not explicitly Christian understand what the good man is. Mm-hmm. They understand that the, their strengths are not given them to do whatever they want, but to provide and protect and take care of those that they love. So this is kind of a uh, maybe a more of an apologetic question then. Um, uh, you, you basically kind of uh, just talked about natural revelation of of masculinity, kind of drawing from natural revelation on masculinity. How does how does that answer kind of the transgender you know world where it, it you know our um, biology doesn't really mean much about who we are? Does that does that? Yeah, because right now a lot of people are just throwing that out the door and saying biology can mean whatever we want it to mean. Um, a man can get pregnant too, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> right. So then when we're talking biology, we're talking about sex, we're talking about two different things. How are you communicating to someone that, and it seems like even with the pushback that are coming, when you say you're getting pushback from Christians, I'm like, oh, That's, we're doomed. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> if the you know, Christians are having a hard time being able to identify masculinity and, and manhood, and and the, the natural general revelation is marred so much by sin. How are you communicating the realities of this mm. truth? Um, but even bio- biologically, yeah. 
Well, well, fortunately, I already wrote Love Thy Body, <laughs> yeah. which deals exactly with that question, which yeah. deals exactly with how transgenderism separates the person from the body. I mean, transgender activists argue explicitly that your gender identity has nothing to do with your biological identity. Um, there's a BBC documentary that says at the core of the debate is the idea that your mind can be at war with your body, at war. Mm-hmm. And it's, of course, it's the mind that wins. Or another BBC uh, video was put up put up for teenagers, and it featured a young woman who was clearly a woman, but she identified as non-binary. And she says literally, it, this is a quote, it doesn't matter what meat skeleton you've been born in, it's your feelings that define you. Mm. So ever, yeah, ever, ever since that... That, what you're talking about is an extremely important question, and but I deal with that much more in Love Thy Body because there I talk about the importance of the body as part of our identity because Christians have lost that too. I mean, Christians with a sacred secular split often don't have a high view of the body. As one of my students once put it, growing up in the church, I was always taught uh, spirit good, body bad. Yep. <laughs> yeah, well, of course, that's Gnosticism, Nancy. Yeah. And, and it's, that's a bit yeah, of per- exactly. yeah, pernicious. Exactly. So I, in some ways, we need to go back and recover our own heritage because, right. you know, the Christian church, the early Christian church had to stand against Gnosticism right. and, and Platonism and Manichaeism and all those other ancient isms that all denigrated the body. So we need to recover the biblical view that the body is part of God's handiwork and part of our true identity. Yeah, and that and then that gets to the question of uh, you know how did we come uh, to be as we are? If you're a Darwinist, it's just simply kind of agonistics. It's just basically kind of the the struggle to survive, and this is just kind of the the outcome. There's no implicit design. There's no no good that's being served. So when God says at the end of the you know days in creation, good, 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 and then very good. Um, so Gnostics don't agree, <laughs> and and generally speaking, uh, materialists don't agree either. Mm-hmm. Good is a moral judgment, and uh, if you if your entire uh, uh, approach to the natural world is amoral, then you, uh, there is a sense yeah. in which you you, you know you're you're not looking for purpose in things any longer, mm-hmm. uh-huh. except in a in a in a just kind of rudimentary way. This is the way. Uh, you know, this particular, I don't know, crustacean survives, mm-hmm. <laughs> that mm-hmm. kind of thing. But no, 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 that, that's not a moral good. That's just a, a, a kind of uh, a, a, an instrumental good for survival. But yeah. uh, when we're thinking about the body as Christians, we can't separate purpose from goodness. Right. And then uh, this tendency that we have to locate, um, you know, goodness exclusively in the spirit Mm-hmm. As, a, as a as you know over against the body uh actually lends itself to this this problem that we're dealing with but gnosticism actually is very at home in the modern world i think it's almost uh, mm-hmm. uh it's 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 uh it was almost inevitable that it'd come back yeah Oh, yeah. And I agree with you. Uh, Modern materialism denigrates the body in the same way by saying that nature, nature has no telos, no teleology, no purpose. Uh, It's just a product of blind material forces. And the logical conclusion is if your body is a product of uh, purposeless forces, it has no intrinsic purpose that we are morally obligated to respect. There is a, um, well, um, as as, uh, Richard Dawkins put it, you know, there was no no good, no evil, uh, no purpose, no design, just blind, pitiless indifference. Yeah, right. is one of his except for that quotes. statement. <laughs> except for that statement, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. There's also a, a well-known feminist and lesbian whose name is Camille Paglia. Oh yeah. He, oh, yeah. He may, yeah, figured you know. <laughs> um, but she has a, a phenomenal quote where she says. The reason a lot of Christians read her is because she is a bit of an iconoclastic feminist. She does not believe that sex is a product of um, social, it's just a social convention or a social construct. She says, no, 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 nature made us male and female. But then you say, well, in that case, how do you defend being a lesbian? And here's how she puts it. She said, you know, nature made us male and female, but why not defy nature? After all, and this is a direct quote, Mm. fate, not God, has given us this flesh. We have absolute absolute claim to our bodies and may do with them as we see fit. 
So it's exactly what Chris was saying. Modern materialism is Gnostic in the sense that it says uh, the, the logic is if our bodies are products of mindless material forces, purposeless forces, then they have no intrinsic purpose. They give us no clue to our identity. They give us no moral message. We may do with them as we see fit. So I I agree with you to really counter transgenderism and homosexuality as well. We have to go back to the science because it's Darwin really that left us with this uh, right. view that nature has no teleology, it has no purpose. And of course, science is on our side here because it's quite clear that living things are structured for a purpose, that on a very fundamental level, that ears are made for hearing and eyes are made for seeing, wings are made for flying, fins are made for swimming. The entire uh, development of the organism is driven by an inbuilt plan or blueprint, which is DNA. So science itself tells us that nature is designed for a plan, a purpose, a goal. Um, and when we, what Christians are saying is when we live in harmony with that purpose, we will be happier and healthier. You know, I, I, I look back at the abortion fight that we had, and I, I'm, I'm concerned about that because I want to believe you. I think that there, uh, let me first say, I believe there is a brick wall of reality that everybody's going to run into. Like, you can't avoid it. That's un- unavoidable. But going back and watching the argumentation and the process, I we thought that we knew the science was on our side even then, too. But mm-hmm. I don't think we expected them to swallow the reductio so hard so that when we made the arguments of reality and the facts about us, a human being in the womb, we just thought if we can get them to admit that, that we would then win the war. But then they admitted it and they just said, who cares? And so, you know. Well, okay. They, what what the what the intellectuals did, what the secular bioethicists did, um, uh, Peter Singer at Princeton, a bioethicist at Princeton, pretty much led the way. What he did is he said, well, this is uh, there's a distinction between being human be- and being a person. So he acknowledged that the fetus is human, meaning it's a member of the human race, it's a member of the human species, it's biologically chromosomally human. But then he literally argues that being human has no moral standing, and does not deserve any legal protection. It only deserves legal protection when it becomes a person at some later point. Well, of course, every bioethicist out there defines personhood differently. You know, once you separate it from being biologically human, where do you draw the line? So Peter Singer would say things like self-awareness, autonomy, uh, an ability to plan for the future, even um, things like that. But every bioethicist has a slightly different list. And so it's subjective, it's arbitrary, but that explains how their strategy, they lost, as you as you put it, they lost the case on the scientific level. And most secular bioethicists now agree life begins at conception. I don't know of any major secular bioethicist who denies that life yeah. begins at conception. But then they say, but personhood, <laughs> that comes in later. And for, depending on the person, um, I mean, Peter said, Some of them say before birth. Some of them say it does not become a person until after birth. Um, Both uh, Crick and Watson, uh, Francis Crick, the the two discoverers of the DNA structure, Crick and Watson, uh, who are kind of household names, uh, both of them suggested allowing the child to um, live for three days after birth so you could do genetic testing on it. Mm -hmm. And only if it passes the test do you qualify it as a person and allow it to live? Wow. Mm. Peter Singer, Peter, hold like on, Peter Baptist, Singer himself said, a Presbyterian. Three, years, three years of age is even a gray area because how much cognitive functioning does a toddler have? So that's where we are right now, um, where personhood is what counts. Being human has no moral standing, no legal protection. Being human is no longer enough for human rights. Yeah. So what do you think is driving this, Nancy? So, you know, it's it's clear that these these are people who are trying to uh, uh, push back the boundaries to, to sort of open up, uh, you know, uh, our, our sort of moral culture to practices that have been historically condemned, uh, infanticide, euthanasia, so forth. What's, eugenics, what's, yeah. yeah, eugenics. What's driving this, do you think, uh, at a, a motivational level? Oh, that's a good question because you know what I do is I read, I read the experts, and help Christians understand what the secular bioethicists are saying. 
Uh, if you want to get down to the deeper level, then you're probably getting into the spiritual right. realm. Right. <laughs> um, where, uh, but I, I, I would like to also say, though, that people believe what they're told. Um, <laughs> there was an article by a woman who converted to Catholicism. Uh, Jennifer Fulweiler is her name, but didn't become pro-life right away. It took several years before she became pro-life, um, even after she became Catholic. And she says, it's because of what I was taught in sex education classes and public schools. I was taught that sex is for fun and bonding mm. and had nothing to do with childbirth. I mean, I was kind of surprised by this. Surely, yeah, yeah. surely not. <laughs> but she said it was totally disconnected from having kids to the point when I thought if a woman became pregnant, that was akin to being struck by lightning. And I thought, well, that's not fair. <laughs> for right. for a woman to have to put up with a pregnancy that she didn't want, um, and and she said, you know, it was it was very revealing of the mentality. In fact, she said even after I became a Christian, she said my husband and I sat down with a um, a, a marriage a, a series of videos on marriage put out by a non denominational uh, group, and she said even in the Christian right. uh, series of videos when they got to sex. They they talked about bonding and back rubs and staying in shape and using <laughs> contraception, right, but they never right. talked about children. Oh, you know, it's, wow. wait a minute, what is sex for? Right, right. You also have to realize that people, when they're raised this way, they believe what they're taught. So a lot of what we have to do as Christians is just help them. You know, not assume necessarily that it, there's some nefarious motives. It just you know, people sometimes mm. sincerely just believe the, the secular worldview that they've been taught. Mm. Nancy, do you have five more minutes to hang around? Oh, sure. Oh, awesome. Sure. Because we haven't talked about masculinity much. <laughs> yeah, no, that's what I want to get to next. I kind of want to get a little to how, you know, why masculinity is under attack, particularly um, white This conversation just goes all over it, the place. It does, yeah, but it's, yeah. all, it's all connected. So hold yeah. on real quick. You got an ad read. So I got to let you know. Now, listen, Pastor, James White holds the champion ship metal <laughs> on average. Like James White, am I? So yeah. Everybody this week so far has my failed. It's March Madness, and right. so we're kind of, you know. James White is the champ right now, so when you read this ad, that's who you're competing against, just All so All right, you know. so uh, this is for Gravity Jack. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yes, Gravity, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Gravity Jack is a full-service digital agency specializing in the development of of virtual and augmented reality experiences. This is rubbing C.R. Wiley wrong already. <laughs> yeah. like, he's like, self-driving cars. <laughs> Mobile apps, blockchain, and Web3 projects. Founded in 2009 as uh, first uh, the first American agency to offer augmented reality. They even patented it. Gravity Jack's digital experiences have been a source of innovation for small businesses, Fortune 500 companies, and the U.S. military. Get your vision in motion at gravityjack.com. Mm. He's got a voice for yeah, this it, stuff. You know what? You know, I that, think you might have just won on just <laughs> voice alone. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. We're going to continue to talk to Nancy Piercy. The Toxic War on Masculinity. Go get it. Coming out in June. Coming right out now. June. Just Coming out make, June. make sure yes. they have to already go and do a print as soon as it starts. Yep. More with Nancy Piercy and the paywall. If you're single, get married. If you're married, have kids. And if you have kids, go baptize them. Until Monday. Love God with all your yes. heart, soul, mind mind and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Go fight, laugh, and feast. This is Cross Politic. Home. It's where you build your legacy, where traditions are started, seeds are planted, meals are shared, and stories are told. We are Chris Natalie Carpenter, owners of Story Real Estate, and our team of top agents helps people find homes in Moscow, Idaho, and around the country. Have you thought about a move? Contact us to get connected with a top agent who shares your values and puts your family first. Or reach out to us about our Moscow Relocation Guide. Wherever you're looking to go, we can help you find home. Call us at Story Real Estate or visit us at storyrealestate.com and start building your legacy. Free men need to be able to protect their families. It's really sad to see people hurt, livelihoods destroyed, even homes destroyed, just to make a political point. Free men take action when churches face heartbreaking attacks. And while cowards stand idle, free men run towards the sound of gunshots when children are in danger. I'm so thankful for free men who stand ready with the tools of liberty.